Good afternoon. All right, we're here to uh, brief our deputy involved shooting from uh, March 12th, uh, 2023. Uh, my name is Sheriff John Allen. Uh, a couple things before we get started. I want to acknowledge a couple people within our department. <clears throat> Hopefully that everybody has been seeing the excellent work that our deputies, civilian staff, call takers, and dispatchers have been doing here in Berlino County. So I want to throw a shout out to them because they're actually doing a lot of difference for our community, um, making a difference in this crime wave that we're seeing and we'll continue to do so. Also, so we're very uh, transparent up front, the way these deputy involved shootings uh, briefings will go on is every one of them will be different. And what I mean by that is the time frame. And what I mean by the time frame is it depends when we interview our deputy, how many deputies that we have involved, um, the complex issue of investigations, how they are. It'll never be two or three days. I'll be very upfront right away. We will always make sure that we do a thorough investigation. And sometimes it might be two days and another one it might be five or six days. But we'll always make sure that you have all the information that is needed when we do briefings such as this. Later on down the road, uh, because of adjudication purposes and things that go through on with the courts, we will have a YouTube channel to make sure that the, the whole incident is caught with narrative, overhead maps, body-worn cam, and any other information that we have so all of you, we can get your questions answered and that we're totally upfront about the investigations that we are doing. Uh, but for here, I'm going to go ahead and introduce uh, Chief Deputy uh, Nicholas Huffmeyer to go over the um, Get me involved shooting itself, and then I'll answer some questions later. Okay, thank you, Sheriff. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as the sheriff mentioned, we are here to give you a breakdown of the details of the deputy involved shooting that occurred on March 12th, uh, the location of which is uh, 224 Atrisco Vista Boulevard. Um, that is a mobile home community, uh, again, on, on Atrisco Boulevard, Atrisco Vista Boulevard within the county. So the agenda for this afternoon, it'll be a, I see some familiar faces in the room. It'll be a, a relatively familiar format for you. Uh, I'm going to provide you with a slide with some case information in the event that you want to IPRA any of the information. There's going to be some details on the screen that you'll need, the CAD number, the case number, etc. Um, and as with our other deputy involved shooting briefings, we'll provide you with a thumb drive. Is that correct, Jamie? Is it on a thumb drive? We'll provide you with a thumb drive at the conclusion of today that will have everything that you're seeing on the screen. Um, so you're not going to leave today empty handed. Uh, so the case information, a timeline uh, as we know it currently, uh, the details that happen starting with the initial dispatch call all the way through the, the conclusion of the call and the shooting itself. Uh, there's two sets of video that we'll show you. One is the 911 dispatch call. Uh, and there were many 911 calls that happened over the, the course of the incident itself, uh, as well as a video compilation of, of the body camera footage. As you can imagine, an incident of this magnitude, there's a tremendous amount of footage. You're welcome to IPRA that footage and watch every single second of it if you like. It's just not in a presentable format for a, a press briefing. So we've put together the, what we think are the most critical portions for you to view today. And uh, that will include some of the negotiations that took place with the suspect and one of our deputies on scene who was trying to de-escalate the incident. Uh, the shooting itself, which was captured uh, on a dash camera from one of our vehicles. Um, and then uh, some of the other footage, this is at nighttime, so some of the other footage is relatively dark, but you can still hear the audio and get a sense of what's happening um, in real time there with the deputies that are on the scene. We also have a, a collection of some evidence photos that were taken by CSI as they're processing the scene. Uh, and then we have a pretty extensive amount of suspect information as the sheriff is gonna discuss later on this afternoon about um, some of the concerns that we have uh, with this individual uh, being on the street and even being out in the community able to, to commit some of the crimes that he has. And so I'll leave that for the sheriff to discuss, but there's definitely a story to be told there not necessarily about the shooting itself, which the evidence will, will speak for itself, I think, on the screen, but the story about why is this individual out in our community repeatedly victimizing people. 
Um, so the sheriff is going to discuss that specifically, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, we have the CID team here as well, the lead investigator. If you have questions I'm not able to answer, uh, we can defer that over to them. So we'll proceed. So with the case information slide, again, the date, March 12th. The start time of the initial dispatch call, 3.54 in the morning. Again, the location, 224 Atrisco Vista Boulevard Southwest is trailer number 613. Our lead case agent's name is there, the case and CAD number are there. Again, that will be included on the thumb drive. It'll be provided today in the event that you want to IPRA uh, any of that information uh, for, for your own investigation, your own, your own news releases there. The timeline. I know the font is a little bit small. I'm going to read all of these uh, because I do believe that they're important to establish what exactly was happening throughout the course of the call because we're not going to be watching hours and hours of video this afternoon. So at 3.54 in the morning, a female victim calls into BCSO dispatch advising that the suspect, Jose Santiano, was in her residence and was armed with a gun. A minute later, the victim sets the phone down out of fear, and you're going to hear that she indicates to dispatch that if the offender, the suspect, sees or hears her on the phone and that he believes that she might be on the phone with the police, that he would hurt her. 359, Jose is heard on the 911 recording saying that he heard her say his name and asked if she was talking to police. Victim gets on the line with our dispatchers there at 416 in the morning saying, hurry, I can't talk. 421 in the morning, deputies arrive and set a perimeter. One of the first things that I looked at um, from a response side was 354 versus the 421 timeline. Our deputies got there much sooner. They had to wait outside of the gate of the mobile home park because the gate code that we had been provided from the facility had been changed and we weren't notified about it. So uh, I recognized right away that, that that response time is longer than our, our average response time for a priority one call, almost double. Um, but the deputies were outside and couldn't get into the facility, so they were delayed in responding. Uh, 4.23 in the morning, the victim is able to safely exit the residence, and a man is seen behind her. Uh, that is the suspect who remained inside. 4.31, deputies begin uh, PA announcements outside in an effort to get Jose to come outside and surrender peacefully. 4.32, one of our deputies on scene announces uh, over radio that he observes the subject is armed with a rifle. 437, a sergeant on scene convert, uh, confirms with the victim that we did have felony charges. Those charges from that night uh, were aggravated assault with a deadly weapon that he committed against uh, the original calling party there, that victim that called at 354. 454 AM, Jose's doing a variety of things inside the residence, turning lights on and off, going from room to room, um, and he is looking out of one of the windows. You'll see where the shooting ultimately happens, um, which it appears as though he was looking for targets, uh, potentially our deputies. 459, deputy, uh, one of the deputies on scene I talked about a little bit earlier that you'll see in the video who was negotiating with the subject has phone contact with him. He tells her explicitly that he wants the SWAT team to come, that he's armed, um, and in fact later on goes, goes on to say that he's going to kill one of, one of the deputies on scene. 5.03 in the morning, deputies begin evacuating nearby trailers. We have some knowledge, you know, the ballistics of rounds going through trailers, the danger to some innocent life in the surrounding trailers. We, we believe that it was necessary at the time to start evacuating as many of those people as we could. 509, Jose fires a single gunshot out of the trailer. And I'll show you on the evidence slides uh, some of the impacts of the rounds that the suspect fired that uh, went out of his own trailer, out of the windows. They impacted some of our uh, vehicles, marked patrol vehicles, as well as a neighboring trailer. 5.14 a.m., once Jose gets back on the phone, he tells that same deputy, I'll kill one of you guys, I promise I will, that's a quote. 5.20 a.m., Jose fires a single gunshot at a BCSO vehicle out of the south window, uh, and deputies do confirm that he is using a rifle at the time. 5.22, Jose continued shooting, and uh, the deputy that, that ultimately was in the exchange of gunfire with the suspect returns fire from a prone position, and I'll, I'll show you what that looks like here in a moment on the video. 
between 7 a.m. and 7.52 a.m., so uh, almost an hour, Jose is repeatedly calling in to dispatch. You know, we're continuing PAs and trying to get this subject to surrender peacefully even after the shooting has occurred. He calls in multiple times to dispatch, indicating that he needs help and credit to our dispatchers. We were able to get him to come out of the house and surrender uh, without uh, further loss of life or injury. So we'll go on to the We'll go on to the first set of video. As I mentioned, this is going to be the initial 911 call. Hello, County 911. What is the address of the emergency? 224. A trip will be stopped over by Southwest Train 613. If this is. I just can't talk. Jose Ramon. Santiago has, he is here, very paranoid, he has, I don't know if it's a machine gun or a big black rifle, I don't know, but one they use in the army movies that it's a big arms gun uh, rifle or something, and I take a lot of medicine and he was banging and banging on the door and Automatically, I opened it and he walked in. But do you have a restraining order? Do I have to have one? I don't. I haven't gone by there. Two okay. cops were two cops were out here yesterday. Or yesterday to file charges on him because he broke into my casita yesterday. So I haven't been able to go on it for the weekend. So did he get there on foot or in a vehicle? There's no vehicle in okay. oh, yeah. Boy, he's very paranoid. Did he think he had a drug? Yes, yes. I, I, I gotta go. Stay on the phone with me even if you can't talk. I can't. Just stay on the phone with me even if he you can't talk. He will hurt me if he sees me on the phone. I still want you to stay on the phone with me and just don't hang up the line. You can put the phone down. So she does uh, put the phone down. Thankfully, she, she doesn't hang up. Uh, so over the course of what happens uh, the next several hours or hours or so until she comes out of the residence, we were able to, to at least get some audio, some intelligence there for the deputies on scene and the dispatchers. So she did leave the phone on, put it down, and then she ultimately uh, leaves the residence. So we'll, we'll go on to our next, our next video package. <coughs> Uh, we pause it just right there so I can explain what we're seeing. So um, the the split screen here, the deputy that was involved in the shooting, that is that is Deputy Ruckman. This is his uh, lapel mounted camera, so his body worn camera on the left side there. And then one of our marked patrol vehicles, presumably that would have been uh, there for a marked unit presence, providing PA announcements with the in-car PA system. Uh, that is uh, the, the unit that you're looking at on the right hand side, so that's a dash mounted camera that doesn't move, so you, we have that vantage point for the, for the entire incident. Uh, I will warn you that Deputy Ruckman does take a prone position, so obviously his camera is face down into the ground, so it's dark, but the, the audio is still usable to give, give you a sense of what, what is happening with him. Go ahead, thank you. Talking about the cartel killing his family. Talking about the people on the SWAT team to come and want to take a shot. Pause it one more time. And and just for reference, since we're not looking at an overhead image. Uh, Deputy Ruckman is standing, if, if you were to take the vantage point of the dash cam, he is to the left, uh, right next to the fence between this trailer and the trailer to the left on the screen. So he is just off screen of the dash cam, laying down behind a fence. The victim is your unit, and we're going to move you down the street since it's a one way. So 
Did you shoot something? Well, like I said, we heard we heard a loud pop, and we just wanted to make sure that you were okay in there. You said you were going to wait at TC and be fine. Say it again. You said you were going to TC and be fine. No, I never said that, Hudson. We don't want you to die. No. I heard you. Hudson, that's not true. I never said that, and I don't want you to die. I don't want anything bad to happen to you. I don't mean to say what you think it will be. I don't need you to be fine. I'm not being with us. I don't need it. It is what it is. I mean, I'm going to be fine with nothing. Mm -hmm. How do you think I am? You think it will not put your And again, you, you can IPRA the entire phone conversation and watch the whole thing. It's quite long. She she's on the phone with him for well over a half an hour um, at various points during the incident. Uh, and then you could tell that that phone call takes place after he fires that first shot. Deputies are unsure if, if he was shooting at them or if it even was a shot, a, a dynamic situation like that where you're not faced with the person shooting at you directly, but you hear the sound. They're, they're still trying to figure out what's happening. So go ahead. Subject, this can't be again. Thank you for your equipment that he wanted to kill a dirty boy. She communicates that information as she should to the deputies on scene about the threat that the the, the uh, suspect made. Okay. Now we're doing hot fire. Pause it. Okay. That happens pretty fast. If you take some time and go back and watch it again, you'll see the, the blinds kind of move and the glass shatters. It's, it's dark, so it's a little bit difficult to make it out, but I'd encourage you to go back and watch it a couple times. He shoots through the blinds, uh, and there were two rounds that impacted our marked vehicle, uh, one into the bumper and one, I'll show you, um, pretty, pretty shocking, and thankfully nobody was inside the vehicle, is right through the windshield where a deputy's head would be if they were in the driver's seat. So what you're about to see, um, as I mentioned, so if you're looking at the right half of your of the screen here, Deputy Ruckman is off to the left. You can see the fence in between the two trailers. He's where the end of that fence is, and what you're going to see in just a moment is he's going to lay down. Uh, we know from interviews that he believed he saw the suspect aiming the rifle through the blinds again, and he went to a position uh, that he thought was the most advantageous for him, presenting the smallest target. The suspect's already shot multiple times. So he lays down, so his video will go dark, but we'll be able to continue to hear and see what's happening through the dash cam.
So Deputy Ruckman is communicating. You know, Deputy Ruckman is communicating. You know, mid, mid gunfight with this individual. You saw the suspect fire that first shot. Deputy Ruckman returns fire. There's a, a short pause, and then there's another volley of fire. The suspect actually shoots through his own trailer wall. Um, but I'll show you the evidence photos. It's actually a fairly tight grouping and 100% in the direction of Deputy, Deputy Ruckman. You hear some, some audible things from Deputy Ruckman there. He was un, unsure if he had been shot or not. Uh, some of the debris from the fence um, had impacted his leg, and in that split second he just wasn't entirely sure if he had been shot. Thankfully he was not, uh, and he was able to, to respond you know, consistent with his training and, uh, and return fire on, on that subject. Go ahead. Shortly after that, uh, when he makes those radio transmissions, uh, I believe that the sergeant comes on the air and tells him to pull back. Deputy Ruckman stands up and he moves to a position with, uh, that's going to offer him a little bit more cover. Obviously, trailer walls, very thin, especially when you're dealing with a rifle caliber. The rounds will go straight through it. A wooden fence is no different. That doesn't actually provide us with any cover. So um, he does the right thing, gets up and, and moves back at that point. Some of our evidence photos. These were the two weapons that were recovered inside the trailer after our investigators uh, executed the search warrant. We believe that the bottom weapon there, uh, the, the 223 rifle, is the weapon that the suspect was using at the time. You have a larger caliber uh, AK style rifle there on the top that was also recovered inside of the, the trailer. There is a kind of a black. Um, object there on that top image in the upper right hand corner that's a, an optic and a mounting uh, platform for the optic to be mounted on that rifle. Uh, the pictures of our marked units, the, the bullet impact on the front bumper and then that other image that I showed you of the rifle round that goes straight through the windshield, um, kind of right at the headrest of our marked unit and then some closer up pictures from, from CSI of what those impacts look like. So let's look at the, the large photo here in the middle. So right below the red truck, you can see the, the evidence markers there on the ground. Those are Deputy Ruckman's shell casings. He was laying down right there where that fence comes to an end in the street. And then you can see off to the right hand side, the corner of the blue trailer where the suspect was firing from. Uh, in the lower left hand corner, some images of the rounds that were impacting the fence that he was partially laying behind, that, that our deputy was partially laying behind. Um, we're not entirely positive just because of bullet trajectory and the, the sequence of the rounds that the suspect fired, but this neighboring green trailer had two bullet impacts on that side of the trailer where the suspect had been firing. Go ahead. Just another perspective of the scene from down the street. I think you can kind of put together now where that marked unit was that you're watching the dash cam footage from. It's been moved now as they're processing the evidence. Um, that vehicle gets sealed and towed as a, as a uh, standard procedure when it comes to uh, securing all the evidence within the scene. On the upper right hand image there, you can see the rods that CSI uses to mark the trajectory of the individual rounds that the suspect was shooting. Now some of the rounds he shot out of the glass, um, and that window is now no longer intact. But you can see on the second, what we believe the second volley of fire where he is shooting through the trailer wall um, in the direction of the deputy. That could be because he had already been injured at that point, um, and so he is just aiming in the direction that he believes that the deputy was, um, maybe possibly not even realizing that he's actually shooting through the trailer instead of the window. Uh, then in the lower right hand corner there, 
you can see that the, the primary location that he was shooting out of initially was that window. And then you can just kind of put two and two together there and see where uh, those rounds were, were leaving the trailer wall there on the exterior. Some information about uh, our deputy that was involved, Deputy Ruckman, he is a deputy first class. This was his first deputy involved shooting. He has approximately one and a half years on and thankfully uh, no major injuries were, were sustained by him uh, during this incident. Some information about our, our suspect and this is where I'm gonna hand it off to the sheriff because the next several slides are gonna talk in detail about some of his criminal history and it's lengthy. Uh, Jose Ramon Santiano, 42 years old, and he was a convicted felon, so he, he was not permitted to own or possess a firearm in the first place, let alone uh, have it in the, in the manner and condition that he did on this incident. So I'll, I'll pass it off, Sheriff. You can go to the next slide, please. Next slide. So some things that are frustrating that I've been uh, telling people and warning people about. As you can see, our subject um, has an extensive history. It's a violent repeat offender. Why do we have something on February 23rd of this year, and we're lucky that our deputy is not seriously injured, nor the victim who called? Why are they ROR'd and out in our community, reoffending? and victimizing all of our community time and time and time again. It's frustrating. Domestic violence is also taking lightly here in Bernalillo County and it needs to stop. If you look at 80% of offenders that have shot at law enforcement, they have a domestic violence history. It's on the board for you to see. 50% of offenders that have shot and killed a law enforcement officer have a strangulation history. Our offender has a strangulation history. He pointed a firearm at a victim in the last incident and threatened the victim while wearing an ankle bracelet. Once again, why are they out in our community re-victimizing and re-offending our community? Because what I've been telling people, violent repeat offenders do not belong on the streets. Thus, puts us in a bad spot to have a deputy involved shooting when deadly force is our last resort and our deputy was forced to not only protect the victim that they are servicing in our community, but himself and our other deputies. Once again, why is this offender out in our community re-victimizing and re-offending people of our beloved community? And I'll leave it silent for a minute. Because I guarantee you that nobody can answer my question. So once again, I'm not gonna throw people under the bus. If we do not work together and keep bringing these issues up, we're going to have the same problems over and over and over again. And I hope by the next time I'm standing here that I'm not speaking about the same thing. Eventually, we're going to get it and we are going to understand. Our deputies that are out here putting their lives on the line every day have to deal with this nonsense and they're going to court and trying to keep and keep all of you safe, but then again coming out and dealing with the same people. Yes, there are people who need help in our community, like I've said before. Yes, there are people that are addicted to narcotics. Yes, there are people just like in this history that have a mental health issue, but are self-medicating with narcotics and reoffending and becoming violent in our community. I gave you some stats here, which are the same. They've been that way for the last 10 years. It doesn't change. What it tells you is how violent these offenders that our deputies are dealing with. I wish you could see the reports that I see on my desk every morning on the great job that our law enforcement, including Albuquerque Police Department, is doing to try to keep all of you safe. And I don't need to keep going over why they're released. I think I've made my point. But again, as we go over, and I have it in red for a reason, February 23rd, 
on an ankle bracelet and released in March. And then we get involved in a deputy involved shooting. We have to fix this. I'm done. I think our community is done. So everybody out there needs to call their lawmakers. And once again, we need to discuss with them the seriousness of these crimes and the lives that are at stake every day. And this is one of the many cases that our deputies deal with. And this is one of the many cases that don't involve a deputy involved shooting. Why? Because not only are deputies de-escalating and using their training, they're either arresting people or taking them somewhere else for care <coughs> to make sure once again that you are safe. We're gonna make a dent in this, I promise you. Questions? Um, do we know where you got the rifles? I will let our investigator go. We've, uh, We've submitted a firearms trace with the ATF, but I haven't got the results back yet. Okay, they weren't stolen, though. No. They were not stolen. Okay. Any other so, questions? Uh, how many times was he shot? He was shot uh, three times. And where was he shot? He was shot uh, once in the leg, once in the uh, chest, and we believe some shrapnel hit the face. Okay, I have one more question. Uh, as a crime reporter, um, in the last few weeks, month, I've seen like there was a double homicide. There was, you know, a couple of drive-bys at that same trailer park. I was curious if the sheriff's office is looking into like criminal activity in that area, and if there's any connection with this and those other things, or anything to say about that. We are looking into criminal activity in that area. Uh, I believe we do have a uh, gang uh, attack plan scheduled to be there today. Uh, around that area. Uh, Sheriff, do you know of any other information? Yes, we have a plan going on right now at 224 Chisco because we've seen a, a lot of issues that are going on concerning crime in that area. That's also, we were up there also for community outreach at spring break. Uh, we also know what the homicides, the violence we've seen, the deputy involved shooting, the domestic violence incidents, the narcotics incident. We know that we need to start looking into and providing resources to that area. Um, it is a lower economic area also at the same time, so where are the resources coming from? And are these people being helped? And what can we do as a sheriff's office, other than responding in a negative light, to make sure that we're out there as a tool and a resource for them to help with their success? Going through that line, how do you speak with some of the communities, people in the community, how do they feel right now after this incident? Yeah, they don't feel safe. It's time and time again. So we've had repeated calls out there. Like I said, now we need to put our resources just not proactive patrolling just doesn't mean patrolling and arresting people. It also means like something that we're doing today to make sure that we have the resources for people to speak to us and people also to make sure that they're comfortable with speaking to law enforcement. I guarantee you in this area, um, there are some also some undocumented individuals. Okay, are crimes underreported? Okay. Guarantee you they and, are. Um, regarding this uh, person, Jose Ramon, mm -hmm. this I know that he had a mental issue that you said, and he was treated with narcotics, but he he had received uh, help before, or he hasn't received help before, professional help. Well, has he? Has uh, that's he? something we're confirming now, and that's something I'll be announcing hopefully uh, next week. Like I said, I'm very concerned about people with uh, mental health issues at the same time that are trying to self-medicate with narcotics, which makes them more violent, and we're not solving anything. So that's something that the Sheriff's Office is working on as we speak. We just had the legislative session, and was, everybody was excited to talk about crime, and then that pre-trial uh, crime bill was going through, everybody decided to die. You said call lawmakers, let them know that they're not satisfied with, with what's going on. We're gonna have another session in a year. Is that too long for, to do something about these pre-trial releases and all that? One or two days is too long, because again, they're being released on the street. Um, like I said, I'm not gonna throw people under the bus, I'm always about teamwork and working together. Uh, this is just yet another example of what's been going on and something we need to work with. I'm telling you, it needs to be adjusted. And we can get into the semantics and all the details of it all day, but the problem is the next day and offenders out there, that's what our deputies are doing a great job on catching these folks that are committing crime and hopefully they're not reoffending and it comes to head in something uh, this violent in a situation again. Um, it's something that needs to be entertained once again. And yes, I'll be entertaining and talking to lawmakers myself on an elected seat. Uh, and that's uh, what I chose to do, so yes, and they'll be seeing this press conference, and I'll be on the phone after this press conference. For everybody that uh, watches us tonight on TV, um, 
could you bottom line it? Like, what do you want the takeaway to be for everybody? Uh, the takeaway to be for everybody that this doesn't happen again. Like I said, deadly force is our last resort. And this uh, uh, subject is still alive. He'll be facing the consequences in jail. The bottom line that people want to know is not what we're doing down the road to keep our community safe. What are we doing when we're done and we're away from the cameras? What are we doing right now? Because people in Bernalillo County and in Albuquerque and the city limits, they don't feel safe right now. Um, we can hear about crime stats and I'm doing data analysis. I'm going to give you some really bad news. Uh, the data isn't good and I'm comparing it. Uh, it's going to get worse before it gets better. It will become violent before it becomes more peaceful because we're dealing with people that don't want to go back to jail and the sheriff's office is sending a message to each one of these criminals, we're coming, man. I keep telling you we're coming and I'm tired of it. I can't even walk down the street in my own place in the Donner Ranch without seeing drag racing, uh, a crime in front of me, a domestic violence, narcotics use, going down in the central corridor we've been hitting and, and seeing people shoot up in the, in the middle where kids are. Uh, it's, it's irritating and it's frustrating. And our job and why I was elected is to start handling those problems and assisting and doing it the correct way. Is there any strategy that police have to have rounds in some sectors or counties that are more violent than others? It's far as, you mean like kind of like a warrant roundup? Yeah. Or, like I said, you always look at the data in the hotspots. And that's one of the things we have in City Connect with our website. Where are the hotspots in Albuquerque and within Bernalillo County? Uh, but you have to look at just further in crime. Why are those hot spots? What resources are they? Is it the unhoused? Is it mental health? Is it drug addiction? Is it everything contestant to one thing? Where do we need to go and what resources do, where, where do we need to um, focus on? Organized retail crime, that's huge funneling. We did an operation last night and within the first 33 minutes of the operation we have three arrests to where Victoria's Secret is losing four to $5,000 a month their employees don't feel safe, and then we go over here to the Coles and they're losing the same amount. Their employees don't feel safe and they can't even walk to their vehicles because of all the auto theft here in Albuquerque. The hot spots are everywhere in Albuquerque, and again, I, I hate to be negative, but I'll always be upfront and transparent with you. The crime is bad, it's worse than I thought, now we can address it. Um, just that bullet that went through the windshield, do we know where it went and it got embedded into or where it went through? Like, was it the headrest or the chair? Do we know that? I do know that it traveled through the headrest and afterward it did not exit the vehicle. Okay. All right, thank you, Sheriff. Okay, folks, thank you very much for being with us here this afternoon.